Stay tuned for the Joan Quinn Profiles. Joan served the state of California as a member on the Arts Council and on the Film Commission. She was formerly on the Architectural Commission and fulfilled two terms on the Fine Arts Commission for the city of Beverly Hills. As an editor for Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine, Condé Nast Publications, and the Hearst Corporation, Joan covered the world of fashion, the mysteries of food, the excitement of theater, and the international art scene. She continues to find people who are on the cutting edge of their professions. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm here with author John Martell and director Craig Zisk. Native Californian John Martell was raised in the Central Valley, graduated from UC Berkeley, and after serving as a pilot in the United States Air Force, put aside his creative writing degree and went to graduate from Bolt Hall. <laughs> He's with the law firm in San Francisco, Farella, Braun, and Martell. And as a heavyweight trial attorney, he made several appearances on national TV as an expert. Between writing and practicing law, he is a rock musician <laughs> with an alias. What was your name? Joe Silverhound. How'd you pick that up? I was coming out of a bar one night, very late. <laughs> <laughs> after too much tequila, and it just came to me. I, I have no explanation for it. I also felt that by the time I succeeded, if I did, that I'd have silver hair. Did and anyone? I did. <laughs> you did if you, all this time. Did anyone in the uh, law profession know you were Silverhand? Oh, all my partners. Joe Silverhand. All my you? partners did. Did they? My clients did not. That's what I wondered. That was a very touchy subject. I, I was leading a double life. Uh, by day, I would be trying cases for the Bank of America and its subsidiaries. By night, I would let my hair down. Was it really long, too? It was shoulder length. <laughs> but that was rather fashionable in those days. Uh -huh. And uh, I would go play clubs. Go play cl in San Francisco? In San Francisco. And you, you wouldn't run into people that you knew or the clients or? Not the, cl <laughs> not <laughs> not the clubs I played. <laughs> Is that why? <laughs> We're going to talk about the country rock songs, because you've written over a hundred, right? Yes. And, and how did you have time to write that in between, and did those songs play any part in your writing career, your, your novel career? The way I did it was not a lot of sleep <laughs> and dancing as fast as I could. <laughs> so they say, yeah. right? Yes, they did. And I, uh, was any of the subject matter transferred into novels or novel uh, matter well, into songs? Well, they say that the best songs are country songs because they tell a whole story in three minutes. Yeah, and they're sad usually. And they, make, and it, yeah, they are. Little black train are coming. <laughs> and, uh, and so you have, to, you have to learn editing because you have to edit that thing down to a whole story in three minutes. And that, I think that's part of what carried over into my... But in a novel, you, you write 500 pages. I try not to. <laughs> and in your briefs, did you write, like, long briefs? I've always thought, keep your briefs <laughs> concise. Uh, and, and much like novel writing, grab the judge's attention at the beginning, lead him carefully from paragraph to paragraph, to an inevitable conclusion that your client is right. That you want, <laughs> that's right, that the we conclusion were, that, that the, you want. That, that we're the good guys. Or that you know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so why did you go to law school? You were like this fantastic pilot in the Air Force and you were riding high and what would you have done if you came out and didn't go to law school? Well, I had offers. I had offers from Ivy, I graduated from school and I had offers from IBM and places that like business I, things? Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't see myself as a salesperson. Oh, I see. So I went to the dean and said, what takes three years? I've got three years of uh, GI Bill coming, and I want to use all of it. Oh, oh, I've been oh. in the service for five years. Right. I want my three years. Right. So he said, well, if you get a master's degree, no, that only takes a year. You can get it better than that. No, that takes four. Wait a minute, here's something. Law, three years. Is that right? I graduated in summer session, and I said, when does it start? And he said, Monday, right up the street at Bolt Hall. So that's, that's so how I became... So they just accepted you? That was it? 
In those days, it was very simple. <laughs> now, uh, my husband's a lawyer. Nowadays, he said I couldn't get into law school. I don't so think I could either. <laughs> I couldn't and I probably wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe you wouldn't because then you would go for your writing degree. Um, all the time you were building a firm in San Francisco, were you, were you writing then? I didn't start writing until the early 80s. <clears throat> I, I was writing legal briefs and teaching writing. And oh, I, you were teaching writing? Yeah. You weren't well, teaching law? No. No, I was teaching legal writing. Oh, legal to, writing. To, to, ah. Along with other... Uh, partners <coughs> in the firm. So the transition was really quite simple once I had a concept. And one morning I woke up and I had this idea that I thought was original. And fortunately I had a friend who knew an agent, big time agent, and uh, the agent agreed to meet with me, heard the idea and said, give me an outline. I gave her an outline. She said, give me three chapters. I gave her three You're chapters. You're kidding, really? Simon and & Schuster and Bannon started bidding for the book. And, all I, all and what I book was that? Was that that wasn't yeah. Billy Strode? That was called Partners. That was Partners. That was your first one. Nineteen eighty-eight. <clears throat> I have them backwards. I have Billy Strobe, Conflicts, The Alternate, and then Partners. It's it goes just, the other way around. It's just the other way around. <clears throat> yeah. So Partners was it about your partners in the law firm? It was a it was a double entendre. A partners they were the man and woman were partners, and they wanted to be partners in other respects. And of course, that's a taboo in the law business. Yes. To, uh, you know, especially with a younger associate and a male partner. So, uh, they ran into all kinds of problems. So that was a, that was the idea you gave no, her. No, the the idea was more, slightly more complex. Than that. It wasn't. <laughs> the idea, so so yeah, go on. Well, the idea was simply that s these lawyers were so evil that in order to make their case better. They actually began poisoning their own clients. Oh wow, that is <laughs> partners. Okay, what about the alternate? Was that about juries? The alternate was about an alternate juror. Yeah, I figured. <laughs> who was nuts as a bunny <laughs> and uh, got into all kinds of trouble. And conflicts of interest? Conflicts of interest brought in my pilot background. Oh, it did. Yeah, that it was about a uh, a jet airplane that kept falling out of the sky and killing people. And uh, there was a lawsuit brought by... So you bring the, the law in, yeah. 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 Um, so you write what you know about. Is that the first yeah. thing you teach? <laughs> Unfortunately, I seem to have known about a lot of things. So I can, <laughs> but, I, but that's the other thing. Did you use, did you use any of the cases, because you were a trial lawyer, and you must have had really interesting cases, did you use them in your novels? I never used a specific case. Um, and I don't even know consciously what part of my unconscious found its way into the pages. Uh -huh. But it certainly some of my experience came into being. But nothing is nothing particular. So on each of those these books we've talked about, your novels, you have a whole list of work, did you have to go out and research? Or was it all because of things that you already knew? Uh, mostly things I already knew. The American Lawyer. That, that's what I was going to get into <laughs> next, which is the latest book, The American Lawyer. It takes place in another country. Yes, yeah, so I wanted to. I wanted to do something different. Uh, I wanted to go international. So <clears throat> I was having dinner with my brother-in-law one night, and he began talking about a, an uncle whose nephew had been kidnapped. They had sent a part of his finger as proof of life. They really did? Yeah, they this do This is that. really true? They, they do that. And uh, he, the uncle paid the ransom, and they killed the boy anyway. So the uncle hired a very famous Israeli there who runs a security company and said, find out who did this. But where were we? Where was this? Guatemala. It was in Guatemala. Guatemala, Guatemala. City, where kidnapping is rampant. Uh, in fact, my wife and I nearly got kidnapped. So that goes into the research. So you went to Guatemala. I we went to Guatemala <laughs> uh, with my uh, brother-in-law and his adult niece, their adult daughter, my niece. We ended up coming back from the Bay of Honduras where we had done some research. And the host had fallen behind in a sports car because he wanted to put his top up. 
So he saw what, what we didn't see, which was that a van had pulled past us and tugged in close behind us on a blind road, twisting road. What we didn't see is that another van was coming up behind us, oh, oh. which is the typical way of... So they go in front of you and come in behind they, you? They box you in, pull you off the side of the road, drive the, first, <coughs> drive the car into the first van, ransom us. Oh. However, <coughs> be, fortunately for us, because the host had stopped and pulled over, and oh. he was now coming up from behind and saw this developing. Oh, wow. So my niece was riding with him, and she saw this huge 45 automatic pistol come across her face, pointing at the driver of the second van. Our host had pulled up beside the second van, again on a blind curve, and... He had a gun? Oh, everybody has a gun in Guatemala. <laughs> he had an AK-47 in the trunk. No. What did he do, your host? What kind of a... Was he a businessman? He, he's, he's the biggest corn miller in Guatemala. So he's a businessman. He's a businessman. And he carries that kind of weaponry yeah. with? Yeah, everybody wow. carries guns and everybody <coughs> uses them. So what happened? So they got scared and they left? The second driver just signaled, you got me. Oh. Picked up his cell phone, <gasps> called the first guy, they pulled off the road, we safely went back to Guatemala. Really? Five hours And away. nothing happened? You didn't try to apprehend those guys, you just oh, let yeah. them go? <laughs> Be serious, Joan. <laughs> we are five miles out of civilization. Wow. We were very glad just to be alive. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So, okay, this is part of the research. Did that go in the book? You know, I had to cut this book. This book was 900 pages when I finished the first draft. And I had to do a lot of editing. And that, that, that story didn't make it, but a lot of them did. And how do you actually write physically? My system is rather typical of someone who was a lawyer for three years. Are you a yellow pad? <laughs> Very well organized. Um, I pretty much know where I'm going with the book. A lot of people just take off and start writing, but I, I feel that I need to control the characters as much as I can. And what I do, simply, Joan, is I take a sentence put on another sentence, and I tell a story through sentences. Then I expand each sentence into a, a, oh. into a sentence, or a paragraph. Each paragraph. Each paragraph into a scene, and each scene into a chapter. I just thought suddenly I've got a book. So do you, do you actually, do you use a computer, or do you use computer. a yellow pad? I could <laughs> not function so, without a computer. Because I know uh, Jackie uh, Collins always used a yellow pad, she said. A lot of, a lot of, a few people still do. Do you, do you make an outline, or it's all in your head? Uh, I, I make an outline after I have gone through and created these sentences that tell the story. And then I expand it. And then, then you start sentence by sentence. Yeah. Um, one thing that I want to also bring to light here, because you talk about it a lot, is commerce and art as a lifestyle. I don't Explain that to us, because it's very well, for, in the forefront of your thinking, I think, com commerce and art. Yes, I, I, th I think I was destined to be an artist. Somewhere along the way, uh, I, I, I got married and I felt the need to make some money. And I didn't have the courage to think I could make it writing uh. or playing music. So I set aside music, set aside writing, became a lawyer, got swept into the law. So that was the commerce. Oh, I see. The art and commerce have always been at war in my life. Yeah, that's what that's what it's, it seemed like to yeah, me. Yeah, it's been a constant battle with occasional compromises and rare detente. <laughs> <laughs> but for, you say the war is well, over. <laughs> well, for, for, well for, it is now because I'm only doing pro bono work. I, I don't I don't work 12 hours a day as a lawyer anymore. But uh, so the war is now over. Form of the, Declare the armistice. The war is over, and so is our interview. Oh, I'm <laughs> <Perfect>. sorry. Perfect. <laughs> so thank you so much for being with us. And um, this is a big, heavy book to carry around. So we're reading it at home. Okay. Jack, we're sharing it. Jack's reading it. You can see his little marker oh. here where he's <laughs> reading. And, and I started reading it. And thank you very much. Thank you, Joan. It's my pleasure. And don't go away. We'll be right back with director Craig Zisk. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. 
I'm here with Golden Globe winner Craig Zisk, a director who went to SC where he was an English major and then Craig went on to produce and direct over 60 TV shows and different TV series. Uh, his Globe was for Brooklyn Bridge and he um, also was nominated for an Emmy and the Larry Sanders Show and Weeds. His name is attached to Big C, Nip, Tuck, Smash, Nurse Jackie, and The Office. And you've seen it if you look because he's just done so much TV work. But after all that experience, he just debuted his first feature film called The English Teacher. So how did you start? Did you go to film school at SC? I did not go to film school at SC. I was an English major. And, and what uh, were you going to do with English? I, well, I wanted to be in film school. They actually <laughs> didn't accept me. They, uh, they are accepting now. I'm very close to the film school. I'm very involved there currently. But, because uh, you're a big TV director. Yeah, no, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> it doesn't hurt. But, uh, but they've been very good to me. And uh, so I had applied as a freshman and undergrad and did not get in and was going to reapply. And I have a brother who's a director as well who did go to SC. I was going to ask you if there was showbiz in your yeah, family. Yeah, my brother Randy, who's a fabulous director, um, went to SC film school and is a few years older than I am. I said, I'm going to follow reapply. Your yeah, I'm gonna, I want to follow in your footsteps because <laughs> it's amazing. And I uh, said, I'm going to reapply for my junior year, which is really where the film school production classes start your last two years. Uh -huh. And he said, don't bother. You don't need it. Just go to work. So how do you go to work? So I had a family connection with uh, Gary David Goldberg, who, oh. as you know, was the creator of Family Ties and Spin City and has done many, many movies and TV shows. And he offered me a job as a production assistant on Family Ties. Oh, that's how so you started, that's how as I started. a production assistant. Right. So you were on the set every I minute. Was, uh, I was uh, getting uh, the writers their lunch. I was taking <laughs> care of Michael J. Fox's car. I was uh, doing anything that was asked, asked of me. But and you were listening and learning, Of course, right? yeah. I was there and watching. And um, I had always wanted to be a director from the time I was a little kid. My brother Andy and I used to make little films. And Where were you born and raised? I was, uh, no, I was born and raised in Dallas, Texas. Oh, you were? Yes. No Texas accent? No accent. No accent. My mother's from Chicago. My <laughs> father's from Massachusetts, although I was born and raised there and lived there until I went to SC. But um, so I just, yeah, I did a lot of time watching and observing and took on uh, another job after that. And when I graduated, I went to go work for John Avnet and Jordan Kerner. Oh, so you just went right to the top. Yeah, I was very lucky. But I you kept, worked it, hard I and worked you got to hard. the top. Yeah, I did a lot of driving and a lot of dry cleaning picking <laughs> up. But uh, but that's part of the job. And it's, it was actually John Avnet who pulled me aside one of my first days of working with him and said, look, you know, if you can do all these errands, picking up dry cleaning and lunch well, and you have a great attitude about it, it's going to transfer into your next steps. And really? they were very good to me there. And they, in a two-year period when I started to work for them, uh, moved me up fairly quickly. And I was an associate producer on a movie of the week that we were doing. And they gave me my first producing job. And from that, I went to go work for Stephen Bochco on a show called Cop Rock, where I was also uh. a producer. And then ended up again with Gary Goldberg on Brooklyn Bridge. And that's when you got a Golden Globe. Uh, yes, the show was uh, nominated and won in its first season for uh, for best uh, best new series. Or was best it series. Oh, sorry, best series. So yeah, and uh, it was amazing. It was an amazing night, and we had uh, it was it was the best television working environment uh, I had had up to that point and maybe even to today. It was an amazing group of people. Did you find any support from your university days? Because most of the people who go to film school say that that group of people they're with are their support system. Yeah, I mean, even though that I, I wasn't able to take production classes um, at the time, I'm not sure what it's like now, but at the time you could take writing classes, criticism oh, right. classes, and so I did form um, a little family of USC film people, they but mostly, together. yeah, and mostly in the world of writing and, and ended up running into them as we were uh, kind of working our way up in the business. So. I, I think the idea that you talked about being able to drive, which is what people right. need, right? <laughs> right? And picking up the doing their errands, is like being in the mail room. Absolutely. It is the boot camp of <laughs> producing and directing, yeah. for is sure. It? Yeah, I mean, it's very similar to the agency process where you start in the mail room. So you, you have, have to pay your dues. You have to, yeah. But you, but you have this lifetime of TV shows, more than anybody could make. I mean, you're a young director. Um, 
How did you make the transition to the English teacher? It was, uh, I was again, very fortunate. I had been working on uh, a bunch of shows at Showtime for probably oh, seven years. Oh, you've been doing films? I, no, I just oh. had been doing uh, Weeds and United States of Terra, Big C, Nurse Jackie. And I was working with all this incredible material and incredible actors like Mary Louise Parker and Tony Collette and Laura Linney and, and uh, reading all these feature scripts that were being sent to me based on my experiences on those shows and um, hadn't read anything that really captured me the way that those shows did. And I felt like to make really? that transition, I really wanted to find a piece of material that was at least as good as that or better. And I were kept turning looking? things down. Oh were yeah, you I was looking, looking. You were looking. Yeah, you were for looking. about the last five or six years prior to the I English see. teacher, I was being sent scripts to consider directing. One thing, um, I know I said you were attached to these other uh, TV shows and you were attached to your sister's sister. Oh, yes, sorry, yes. And you, and you yeah, had a, a thank you. I had a thank you. But that was before you even became a, a, a director well, that was on me. the I English was, teacher. The reason for that was I was, at the time, the executive producer of the United States of Terra. Oh, that's what And uh, Rosemary DeWitt, uh, wanted to, they had, a, they had an actor fall out in that movie and they needed somebody very quickly and they really wanted Rosemary DeWitt and so they called me as the executive producer and said, is there a way to work around the oh. schedule? They literally needed, they called her on a Saturday and said, we need you on Monday. And did and you we, do it? Yeah, so I said, we'll work around it. How can I deny her this great opportunity? And that was your thank you. Right, on so the I screen. got a thank you. I didn't realize that I had a thank you on screen. No, That's good but to I know. Didn't I love the movie. I, didn't, I guess I didn't make it all the way through the credits. But I didn't see a, your name on the credits, but I know you funny. got a thank you, and I thought maybe that was, that was the reason. You were on the set, and you were learning on no, the set. No, at that point, I was, uh, I was executive producing television shows, and I, I, I was sent the English teacher and instantly fell in love with the material. Because it was something that you were familiar with, you're, you, you studied English literature, or you... It, it, well, I think it? That, was a, that was a big element for me, and it, it's actually, when you see the film, it's an, a big element of the, of the movie. I saw the film. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and you enjoyed it, I hope. <laughs> um, but for me, I've always been attracted to interesting characters. I've well, directed a it. lot of drama, I've directed a lot um, of comedy, and I've been fortunate to kind of play in both those worlds, but the one common denominator for me has always been finding good material. And when I read this script from Dan and Stacey Sheridan, I just felt like I was seeing the movie from page one to the end. I knew exactly how I wanted to do it. I met with the producers. They seemed to uh, like my take on That's the what film. comes next. Yeah. You like it, then you meet with the producers. Right. But the writer... Went to SC. Yeah, did there you it's know a him? couple. I didn't. It's a couple. Dan and Stacy. Oh, did, and, uh, do they both? Sheridan, go to SC? They both went to SC. <laughs> so here you are. You 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 love this material, and the producers like you. You're young. You've done a lot of this work, and you get these Oscar nominated, uh, Tony uh, Tony Award winning cast. It's How'd amazing. you pick it? It's amazing. Uh, Julianne read the script. And, Fantastic actress. Uh, amazing. I, when I met with the producers, I went in for my pitch and I told them, this is what I see the movie in my head and this is how I would like to do it. And they liked that. And then we started talking about casting. And so I said, Julianne Moore. This is way you before she read. Her. I saw her. I thought she would be fantastic. I know her work so well. I'd seen all of her movies and felt like she has such tremendous range. She likes to take risks. This would be a project that I hadn't really seen her do. I hadn't seen her really take comedy. the lead in a comedy. She's yeah. always been amazing in these supporting roles in the Coen Brothers movies, and, and she was great. And she's and such a nice right. person. Oh, amazing. She's, she's so nice. I mean, I've seen yeah. her. I don't know her, but I've seen her on airplanes. I've seen her in airports, and she's yeah. nice to everybody. She's nice to everybody. The crew <laughs> loves her. Good she's day. so easy to work with. It comes with a lot of great ideas, very collaborative. And I just saw Nathan Lane. Um, oh, did you see yes, it? Yes, I saw him in the Nance. I and this couldn't fantastic. have been the perfect yeah. part for him. I know. He, and he was perfect. Yeah, once you get Julianne Moore on board of a <laughs> movie that has a great script and you go to anybody and say, how would you like to be in a movie? And You're going to be in every scene with Julianne Moore and you've got this great material. It was very easy to and, get people to say yes. And your young actor. Michael and, Angarano. And, yeah. How do you say his name? I always Angarano. Say Angarano. Yeah, he is so great. Isn't he great? He's fabulous. Yeah. I just saw him in another film, and I just, yeah. he's a standout. Yeah, he really, I think, is going to be the unsung hero of this movie. Yeah. I, he's been working since I think he was six. Oh, he has. Well, he's, he's been working fantastic. for a long time, but hasn't really had, I feel, the breakout that he deserves, because he's, he really 
along with Julianne carries this movie. And Who else do we have? Did Greg we Kinnear. Greg Kinnear, of course. Amazing. Lily Collins. Oh, Lily who, Collins, beautiful. Beverly yeah. Hills girl, right? So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and also immensely talented. Had never done an indie movie before. Really enjoyed the experience. It was really, we shot the whole film in 23 days. So we, we bonded you shoot very it? quickly. Location, where was the location? We shot in Westchester County in New York. Uh, the school was in Dobbs Ferry. We were in, oh, it was? Yeah. Oh, we, we have were, some artist friends who live oh, really? in Dobbs yeah. Ferry. Yeah. yeah, we were in Rye and Terrytown. Oh. And kind of the whole area. Uh, it takes place in a small town in Pennsylvania, but uh, we wanted to shoot in New York. For and the music? Music, amazing. Rob Simonson is our composer. He lives here. He's so Did talented. you pick him? Yes. You picked him? Okay, yeah. so we I never like worked his... with him before, but he, we met, and he just had the same vision that I did for the movie. Costumes? And, Emma Sets. Potter, who <laughs> is, that was the first time I've worked with her, and she, again, is another one of these people that I can't imagine doing another project without her. She has such attention to detail. She did the whole wardrobe, including doing the play, she made, and uh, with a staff of one other person. They, is that right? Yeah, designed and And probably had a little everything. teeny budget. No budget. No budget. <laughs> she was little sitting in the budget. corner cutting little circles out for Lily's costume in, in the play. And I just look over and she was just always knitting or sewing. Or oh, that's just, so she's great. She's amazing. And that's... Michael Shaw was the production designer. Yeah, I, I was going to with... say the style was so beautifully done. Yeah, I'd worked with Michael on the big C, so I knew his work very oh. well. And uh, had always had a great time working with him. And then uh, Vanya Schoenjul was my director of photography, who I'd worked with on Nurse Jackie. Oh, you had one. And he's done these amazing uh, features. And what do you do? What do you tell him to do? Do you tell him what to do? It was, yeah, I mean, Vanya and I collaborate really well. And I had had a vision for the movie. We shot it on 35 millimeter, which these days is very rare. And we also shot it uh, in the anamorphic format, which is widescreen. Oh, you do? Oh, you do. So we were... The great thing about shooting in Westchester County is we both lived in the city. So we would take the train together every morning and we'd have an hour just ourselves oh, on the train where we would just talk about every scene and how we wanted to shoot it. And I'd pull movie clips that inspired me and he'd pull movie clips and mm. it was the great train But it was, you ride. could see that. And it was all Thank you. just, yeah. the, I mean, it was perfect. We wanted to give, it's a kind of a intimate, smaller story, but we wanted to give it a lot of scale. So we wanted it to feel like a bigger movie. Uh, we wanted, we were, I was very inspired by the Merchant Diary movies, which oh, have, yeah. a, as you can see, there's a little piece of A Room with a View at the beginning. Right. And, and it really was this modern day story, but told through the lens of a the, classic in that voiceover. Who's the voiceover? That was brilliant. Fiona Shaw. Who was it? Fiona Shaw. Oh, it was Fiona Shaw. Brilliant. <laughs> Amazing. I love that part of it. The first <laughs> time I, she was in London, um, so we didn't get to meet face to face when I was looking for this voice, and I got on the phone with her, and, and she said, hello, Craig, and I was like, oh my God, <laughs> here's <it>. the voice. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> Let's uh, cut this call short. I knew she was the one, and. And we, after that, ended up uh, getting together. And, and we have to say goodbye, too. So oh. goodbye, Fiona, and goodbye, Craig. Thank you so much. It was <laughs> such a you. pleasure. I, thank you. I know everyone will enjoy the film and your next film, whatever it's going to be. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Keep writing. You can email me at jaquinn1 at aol.com, and we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profile.